most of my characters tend to be lawful evil. People are like, well, how do you play an evil character in a group dynamic? And I'm like, it's easy. They don't consider the people in the group enemies. What if this person was raised saying that they were the herald of the apocalypse? They were what would start the end of the world. But then what if it didn't happen? The concept's fun and making characters is great, but playing them out with a group of people and never knowing which way that concept's gonna end up going, that's the fun part. Hello, friends. Welcome to Characters Without Stories, a TTRPG podcast about the roads not yet traveled. I'm Star. This episode, I'm joined by Abstract, a forever DM working towards owning a gaming store and cafe. Hello. I found Abstract through TikTok, uh, like a lot of my guests. <laughs> He's known for taking characters from popular media and bringing them into a TTRPG context. So I'm really excited to have you on the podcast, and I'll give you a chance to plug your projects at the end. But right now, do you want to tell listeners a little bit about yourself? I am uh, level 38 now. That's the way I like to say it, because it makes it sound <laughs> worse. Not as bad. Family man. I have three children. My oldest is 12. My youngest is seven. Um, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 12 years old. And uh, like you said in the intro, I'm hopefully working towards having my own uh, gaming space. I don't know that it's going to be a gaming store as much anymore as it's just going to be a cafe where gaming happens. So abstract, tell me, who are you bringing to the table today? Uh, well, today I'm talking about my character, Torden Stormborn. Uh, he's a gem, sapphire, dragonborn, tempest cleric. Um, who prays to Torm, the god of, uh, you know, weather and skies and lightning. He's actually a, a religious zealot that is just constantly bringing up his faith and his god. Um, <laughs> I kind of based him off of um, uh, like a Southern Baptist preacher um, where he was very much, you know, in your face with his religion. and you know, very adamant that uh, you should repent your sins and uh, be ready for what he calls the Everstorm, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the name Torden Stormborn? Uh, well, uh, Torden actually means thunder in uh, Norwegian, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Uh, one of the ways I come up with a lot of character names is I just pick a specific word and then I go on Google Translate and translate from English to different languages until I find something that I enjoy that, I, you know, I think sounds like a good name. Mm -hmm. That is, I do that all the time, <laughs> all the time. Yep. Normally it's Latin, but the Latin word for thunder uh, wasn't very good. Uh, and then uh, Stormborn, he was literally born during a storm. Uh -huh. So he was just kind of gifted that name. Um, he doesn't carry a, a family name, per se. Uh-huh. What does Torden look like? It's based off of the antagonist in JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. Um, so it's uh, taking that very, you know, traditional good-looking human and just kind of incorporating that onto a uh, Sapphire Dragonborn. Mm-hmm. But with that, you know, just haughty, evil look and, um, you know, my, most of my characters tend to be lawful evil. Huh. OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've had a lot that come up a lot where people are like, well, how do you play an evil character in a group dynamic? 
And I'm like, it's easy. They don't consider the people in the group enemies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so then they're okay with them. Like any good evil villain is going to have cohorts and allies. And my definition of evil has always been just not following societal norms, right? Like Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean there's this completely selfish megalomaniac, right? But they have, uh, you know, especially lawful evil, they have their own code of conduct that just doesn't align with what everybody else thinks a code of conduct should be. I think the alignment system, to me, is a particular failing of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. D&D. Because I don't think it is complex enough to handle how we are going to approach morality and lawfulness within our games. Yeah. So it's not something I ever really use. I, I was kind of mm-hmm. experimenting. Uh, Matt Colville had a really interesting video talking about alignment and talking about using more of a thematic approach. So that was kind of what I was doing in my in my game. But I, I don't know that it's really necessary. And I think for so many people, if they're relying on alignment, then that's actually hurting their character growth. And if they're not, then they're parts of the game that they don't wouldn't necessarily have access to yeah yeah i 100 percent agree i've always used the uh alignment system as more of just a baseline right like um this is the uh benchmark for lack of a better word of what my character's thoughts and feelings are but uh i've never like strictly adhered to it right Mm -hmm. like you know like i said generally my characters would be lawful evil which i just use like i said they have this code of conduct that doesn't align with what other people think they should do, but they adhere to that. Right. Mm-hmm. And then um, I've actually had a bunch of my characters where they go through a uh, redemption arc, which is one of my favorite things to do. So uh, they go from, you know, being this evil, cold, calculating, not maniacal, but um, essentially what a lot of people would consider a villain. But then as they interact more with the group, you know, they go from being this cold, calculating, almost a villain to being, you know, more in line with what people would consider to be good as time progresses. Right. Like they learn, (laughs) you know, through the power of friendship. Right. If we (laughs) want to really break it down to a a trope. Right. But um, yeah. So like you said, I don't think alignment should be something that needs to be strictly adhered to. But I like to uh, put it forward, especially when I say I'm going to play an evil character to the group at the beginning so I can then explain. Because a lot of groups, as soon as you say evil, they they oh, well, stop right there. We don't allow evil characters. And I'm like, well, OK, and I get why you would say that, because I can see how it can be problematic. But let me explain to you what I mean by evil. And as far as the original alignment chart goes, most player characters end up being evil anyway. <laughs> because they they don't try to redeem the villain, right? They don't mm. try to capture them alive. They don't try to foil their plot. They, they, essentially, they just kill them. That's what happens in almost every game I've ever played. And if you want to be good, murdering the villain is not good. Right? So in both a game that I'm playing currently and in the game that I'm DMing, I'm running a game where all of the characters are teenagers. Mm-hmm. and they killed like a mini boss and then they they were all like this doesn't feel right and we ended up mm-hmm. retconning it and making a rule that you cannot kill npcs that we're just going to assume you're doing non-lethal damage and i think at first i was like oh my god i don't really know what to do with this but it's been really great and then i'm playing in another game where we're talking about genocide so <laughs> it can go in very different directions yeah and that's always something I've tried to encourage players in games that I run is to attempt to capture rather than kill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you make the villain irredeemable, right? Like they've done right. horrible things, you know, maybe they deserve is the word they're probably going to use to be killed, um, depending on what they've done. You know, if you like if you have a lawful good paladin in your group, they should probably be against that no matter how evil that person was. Right. Right. Like uh, or if you have a cleric of Pelor or, you know, one of the the more forgiving gods, they should be more like, well, hey, we should he should, you know, sit in trial. He should, you know, be judged by his peers. And 
we we shouldn't be jury and executioner and mm -hmm. uh, but i've rarely 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 had that come up in a game yeah so they have a folk hero background yes so at the folk hero background um his uh backstory was that he was born during a terrible storm um and his mother died during childbirth and as he was growing up he was taken in by a cleric of Torm, uh, who is an evil deity of tempest and storms and uh, lightning and thunder. He was told of a prophecy that a sapphire dragonborn uh, whose mother died during childbirth and who was born during a storm would be the herald of the Everstorm. And the Everstorm being this apocalyptic end of the world event. Do they have a voice? Have you developed a voice for this character? No, because I never really got to play him. Um, generally, I kind of start with a baseline. And like I said, he's kind of based off of, uh, you know, like a Southern Baptist uh, preacher. He was going to be very intense. Uh, but normally what I do with a voice is I'll start with kind of a baseline and I'll develop it as I'm playing the character. Uh, and since I, I only got to play him for one session, uh, that never ended up happening. Mm, yeah, I can see that. Uh, but if if I was going to wing it, right, uh, he'd probably be something like, if the Everstorm comes, brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very, uh, you know, Torm is calling you. <laughs> <laughs> so why did the kind of Southern Baptist preacher persona come into this character? Was that kind of the initial idea? It's, it's a mixture of things. A at the time, I was reading The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, uh, part of the Stormlight Archive. And the Everstorm comes from that. That's where I got that name. And it kind of reminded me, like, what if someone was, you know, the Herald? What if someone was the voice of the Everstorm? And uh, when I was in high school, I was the goth kid, uh, you know, all black clothing, the sterling silver necklaces with like a pentacle on it and uh, long, dark hair. And there was a preacher man that would be outside of my school on a regular basis that would always tell me I needed Jesus. <laughs> So that's it kind of combined those two things together where I was like, what if this, you know, very religious character, you know, was talking about the apocalypse? Uh, well, and at the same time too, Quentin Tarantino's character in the movie Little Nicky. Uh, and I just thought that would be, you know, a really fun, interesting character to be adventuring, right? To come across all of these, you know, different characters and pretty much tell them that they need to repent before the world ends and that the uh, you know the end of the world is nigh so let's delve a little bit back into Torden's backstory how did Torden grow up what were the what was their family like uh well he was raised by his father who after his mother passed his father was kind of negligent so Torden mostly raised himself um you know he had to become independent at a young age when his father was approached by this uh cleric of torm uh after hearing the way torden was born like i said there was this prophecy that said that uh a dragonborn who was born during a storm whose mother died during childbirth would be the herald of the everstorm and I think his father was just kind of like, yeah, sure, have him and handed him off to uh, this preacher. And I think that's why he's not much for relationships of any kind, because it's just not something that was ever in his life. Is there somebody in his life that's really important to him? Uh, well, his uh, his mentor and the cleric of Torm who took him in. He was the only person to ever really show him like respect and kindness and um, kind of talk him up. And that's why he's so obsessed with this idea of the Everstorm, because that's the only thing that anybody's ever told him about himself that he felt was good and worth it. Mm -hmm. 
you're talking about redemption arcs and taking an evil character and turning them in a different direction. I'm curious, how do you think that this would affect his relationship with his mentor and with his church? Um, well, you know, I hadn't really thought of where he would go. Generally, my characters, the redemption art ends up happening through the narrative and through the story. Mm -hmm. I think that during the story, maybe if something terrible happened, he would start saying that, you know, this is the Everstorm. And then if the Everstorm didn't happen, he might start questioning you know, what he had been told and how he had been raised. But, uh, you know, without having gone through the narrative, I, you know, I don't know how exactly he would get there. So when you're approaching creating a character, when you're kind of starting that process, what is that like for you? Like, how involved do you get in the backstory? How involved do you get in building them out before you start playing? Uh, I get pretty heavily involved. Um, I love creating stories, creating characters. Uh, if you watch my TikTok channel at all, and a quick plug, I make uh, NPCs and characters on there all the time. And um, that's something I really love delving into. Uh, usually I start with some base idea. Uh, most of the time, it's just a class. Like if I wanted to play this class, what story would I want it to have made before they became an adventurer? And um, just kind of build it up from there. Uh, I actually think on one of your videos, um, you were talking about making stories and it was just kind of a, a wouldn't it be funny or wouldn't it be interesting if. And uh, I actually read uh, Stephen King's on writing and that's how he said he builds his stories. Uh, like he heard about John Wayne Gacy, the, you know, the clown serial killer. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, what if. That was a being that came from outer space. <laughs> that's that's what started it, you know, and um, uh, I think that's pretty much how my characters have always gone. Like uh, Torden, for example, it was what if this uh, person was raised saying that they were the herald of the apocalypse? They were what would start the end of the world. But then what if it didn't happen? Right. Mm -hmm. Like he'd been raised his entire life believing that this was going to go. And uh, so when I made the character and I'm talking to who should have been my DM for it, uh, and I told him this, he was like, well, I don't think the Everstorm is going to happen in my campaign. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. That's fine. You know, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what the character is based on is he's going to believe that this crazy notion of the end of the world is going to happen. And then it doesn't. And where does he go from there? Right, right. So what made your character start adventuring? Uh, well, uh, Torden was convinced of his own importance um, through his mentor and this prophecy. So he was out to spread the word that the Everstorm approached. And uh, he just kind of ran into adventure along the way. Yeah, like he wasn't uh, searching for it, but he um, <laughs> the, the game we were actually going to play was Descent into Avernus. Mm -hmm. uh, which would have been hilarious, right? Because when the city <laughs> got pulled down into the nine hells, he would have totally, you know, the Everstorm is here! <laughs> right. Uh, in that campaign setting, the one session I got to play is where uh, it begins being pulled into hell, right? Uh -huh. So he just happened to be in the city of Waterdeep when those events started happening around him. Uh, so it was never that he was looking for adventure. It just kind of slapped him in the face. Right, right. Do you ever uh, build a character around exploiting a particular mechanic? And I guess maybe how detailed do you get into actually the mechanical part of the build? Uh, well, uh, my favorite class by far is Warlock. And if you've ever seen any of my content, you know that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that I felt that warlocks were very underutilized. Uh, I never had any player pick warlock in any of the campaigns I run, and I use them as villains all of the time. So uh, when I started playing, I did that uh, where I would specifically pick 
you know, this Eldritch Invocation, right? Like one of my absolute favorites is Devil's Sight, where you can see in Magical Darkness up to 120 feet. And you combine that with the darkness spell, which you can cast on your weapon. And then this pool of darkness just goes with you wherever you go. So then I thought a cool thing to to do with that would be multi-class into way of the shadow monk, which at level Mm -hmm. six can teleport between areas of dim light and darkness. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I made a, a character that was a level six, fiend pack warlock and a level six way of the shadow monk just so i could jump between my own darkness spell yeah Yeah, i mean that's pretty badass (laughs) yeah yep it was a lot of fun and uh the way of the shadow monk when they teleport like that they get advantage on their first attack afterwards Ooh, that's nice yeah so it was a lot of fun. And then because of that player character, um, I ended up making an entire cult to Thera's Dune in a campaign I was running where all of them were a single class and then multi-classed into Warlock. And they all took Devil's Sight. There would just be this huge pool of darkness <laughs> and all these people teleporting in between them. And, oh, it was... My players hated it, but I loved it. I, it was so fun, so much fun. Yeah, sorry, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with your players. <laughs> <laughs> For this character, did you did you have any builds that you included as part of that that you thought it would just be this is a fun way to play in combat? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Tempest uh, domain clerics are just great to begin with. Their uh, class features and um spell list that they get from their domain uh it makes them just a powerhouse and they get to wear heavy armor you're this ridiculous tank with these super powerful spells it it, it's just crazy my my favorite thing i came up with for him though is the thaumaturgy spell okay super basic cantrip right its effect lasts for a minute Okay, and it specifically says in the spell that you can have up to three effects going at the same time. Mm -hmm. So his favorite thing to do was make his eyes look like they were lightning and glowing and it would last for a minute. And then he would make the sound of thunder around him that would go (laughs) in line with the lightning in his eyes. It sounds like he deserves some uh, advantage on his intimidation checks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I felt about it, too. Uh, and that was something uh, the DM, like I said, I only got to play for the one session. But that's something the DM absolutely loved about the character. Um, he's like, you know, that's really interesting. I've never had someone just decide that they have a cantrip. And the way I told him, I was like, essentially, unless I tell you otherwise, that's going all the time. Like just every minute he does it again. Like, okay, yeah. here we go. So why are you excited to play Torden eventually? Well, you know, like I said, in his concept, uh, I just love the idea of this, you know, repent, repent your sins kind of character out adventuring with all of these, you know, other characters and just so convinced of his own importance in the world um and maybe eventually kind of getting smacked in the face with reality that hey you're going around telling people that the world's ending it's not changing anything right and maybe eventually realizing that there are ways he could make change but just you know having to go through the adventure to do it uh you know that's something i'm excited about with any character is just revealing that story that narrative um after the concept right Mm -hmm. like the concept's fun and making characters is great but playing them out with a group of people and never knowing which way that concept's gonna end up going Mm -hmm. that's the fun part yeah definitely so kind of to piggyback there on what you were just saying what kind of campaign do you think torden needs uh, well, he, he was specifically designed for kind of the descent into Avernus thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, something like that, something with big, you know, epic combat and, um, you know, a lot of character growth moments through, um, you know, having to learn to rely on other people and, um, 
you know, having to discover that maybe this prophecy wasn't even about him. It would take a lot of uh, character development for him to get where I would have liked him to. Uh, but yeah, so uh, definitely a long running campaign. You know, he's not the kind of character I'd want to play in a one shot because people would just be like, man, this guy is just kind of annoying. <laughs> you need some time for the other characters to warm up to him. Yeah, exactly. So, and you talked a little bit about um, wanting to kind of have that realization um, on the character's part that the apocalypse isn't happening or it's not happening the way it was predicted. Or you just mentioned even that he is not the herald. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about campaigns to, you know, put him in eventually, what approach are you kind of hoping for there? Or are you more just open to anything? Uh, yeah, I think I would be more open to just anything. Um, but, um, you know, it'd have to be something I would have to clear with whatever group I was going to join. Right. Because like I said before, he's essentially evil at the beginning. Um, and he, you know, has this prophecy and this idea. But I have to kind of clear it with the uh, the DM and the group. Like, is this going to happen? You know, because maybe right. I come up with this backstory and I bring it to a DM and he goes, oh, man, the Everstorm, that's a great idea <laughs> and decides <laughs> to actually have it happen. It'd be something I'd be open to. But like I said, it would definitely have to be a conversation at session zero about the character. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that could be a really fun hook to. Oh, wait. OK, now there is an apocalypse in this world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jordan, what do you think happens after you die? I think the Watchers weigh your soul, the evil you've done, the good you've brought about. See which one weighs more, neither feed you to Torm, send you to paradise. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. I love that answer. Well, thank you, Abstract, for sharing your character with me today. Thank you for having me. How can people find you? TikTok, Twitch, and YouTube. I have the same username on all of them. It's this abstract thought. All one word, no spaces or anything. And do you have any projects uh, coming up that you want to promote? Uh, well, I have just started dungeon mastering professionally, but I am not sure currently whether I am going to live stream it or not, uh, because I might be directly stealing characters and ideas from popular media. <laughs> you can find me on TikTok at S-T-A-R-M-A-M-A-C. That's Star Mama C. You can also listen on YouTube. Just search for Characters Without Stories. Please like, subscribe, rate, review, and share with your friends. Every little bit helps. I'm currently accepting submissions, particularly for non-D&D characters, so if you'd like to share your character, you can go to the submission form at characterswithoutstories.com. Thanks for listening, and may all of your characters find their stories.